Right, welcome back children and we we finished on a very good part last week where obviously Lavender put the newt into the jug. So let's begin. The weekly test. At two o'clock sharp the class assembled including Miss Honey who noted that the jug of water and the glass were in the proper place. Then she took up a position standing right at the back. Everyone waited. Suddenly in marched the gigantic figure of the headmistress in her belted smock and green breeches. Good afternoon, children, she barked. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchbull, they chirruped. The headmistress stood before the class, legs apart, hands on hip, glaring at the small boys and girls who sat nervously at their desks in front of her. Not a very pretty sight, she said. Her expression was one of utter distaste, as though she was looking at something a dog had done in the middle of the floor. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are. Everyone had the sense to stay silent. It makes me vomit, she went on. To think I'm going to have to put up a load with a load of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. I can see that I'm going to have to expel as many of you as possible, as soon as possible, to save myself from going round the bend. She paused and snorted several times. It was a curious noise. You can hear the same sort of noise if you walk through a riding stable when the horses are being fed. I suppose, she went on, your mothers and fathers tell you you're wonderful. Well, I'm here to tell you the opposite, and you'd better believe me. Stand up, everybody. They all got quickly to their feet. Now put your hands out in front of you, and as I walk past, I want you to turn them over so I can see if they're clean on both sides. The trunchbull began a slow march along the rows of desks, inspecting the hands. All went well until she came to a small boy in the second row. What's your name? she barked. Nigel, the boy said. Nigel what? Nigel Hicks, the boy said. Nigel Hicks what? the trunchbull bellowed. She bellowed so loud she nearly blew the little chap out of the window. That's it, Nigel said. Unless you want my middle names as well. He was a brave little fellow, and one could see that he was trying not to be scared by the Gorgon who towered above him. I do not want your middle names, you blister, the Gorgon bellowed. What is my name? Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. Then use it when you address me. Now, now then, let's try again. What is your name? Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. That's better, the Trunchbull said. Your hands are filthy, Nigel. When did you last watch them? Well, let me think, Nigel said. That's rather difficult to remember exactly. It could have been yesterday, or it could have been the day before. The Trunchbull's whole body and face seemed to swell up as though she was being inflated by a bicycle pump. I knew it, she bellowed. I knew as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What is your father's job? A sewage worker? He's a doctor, Nigel said, and a jolly good one. He says we're all covered with bugs anyway, that a bit of extra dirt never hurts anyone. I'm glad he's not my doctor, the trunchbull said. And why, might I ask, is there a baked bean on the front of your shirt? We had him for lunch, Miss Trunchbull. And do you usually put your lunch in the front of your shirt, Nigel? Is that what this famous doctor father of yours has taught you to do? Baked beans are very hard to eat, Miss Trunchbull. They keep falling off my fork. You are disgusting, the trunchbull bellowed. You are a walking germ factory. I don't wish to see any more of you today. Go and stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. But Miss Trunchbull... Don't argue with me, boy, or I'll make you stand on your head. Now do as you're told. Nigel went. Now stay where you are, boy, while I test you on your spelling to see if you've learned anything at all this past week. And don't turn around when you talk to me. Keep your nasty little face to the wall. Now then, spell right. Which one, Nigel asked? The thing you do with a pen or the one that means the opposite of wrong? He happened to be an unusually bright child, and th his mother, mother had worked hard with him at home on spelling and reading. The p one with a pen, you little fool. Say it to us in three minutes so we'll never forget it. She teaches us a lot of words in three minutes. And what exactly is this magic method, Miss Honey, asked the newspaper when you had asked the headmistress. I'll show you, piped up brave Nigel again, coming to Miss Honey's rescue. Can I put her other foot down and turn around, please, while I show you? You may do neither, snapped the trunchbull. Stay as you are and show me just the same. All right, said Nigel, wobbling crazily on his one leg. Miss Honey gives us a little song about each word and we all sing it together and we learn to spell it in no time. Would you like to hear about the song Difficulty? I should be fascinated, the trunchbull said in a voice tripping with sarcasm. Here it is, Nigel said. Mrs. D, Mrs. I, Mrs. F, F, I, Mrs. C, Mrs. U, Mrs. L, T, Y. That spells difficulty. Oh, perfectly ridiculous, snorted the trunchbull. Why are all these women married? And anyway, you're not meant to teach poetry when you're teaching spelly. spelling. Cut it out in future, Miss Honey. But it does teach him some of the harder words wonderfully well, Miss Honey murmured. 
Don't argue with me, Miss Honey, the headmistress thundered. Just do as you're told. I shall now test the class on the multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has taught you anything at all in that direction. The trench pole had returned to a place in front of the class and her diabolical gaze was moving slowly along the rows of tiny pupils. You, she barked, pointing at a small boy called Rupert in the front row. What is two sevens? Sixteen, Rupert answered with foolish abandon. The trench pole started advancing slow and soft-footed upon Rupert in the manner of a tiger stalking a small deer. Rupert suddenly became aware of the danger signals and quickly tried again. It's eighteen, he cried. Two sevens are eighteen, not sixteen. You ignorant little slug, the trench pole bellowed. You witless weed, you empty-headed hamster, you stupid glob of glue. She had now stationed herself directly behind Rupert and suddenly she extended the hand the size of a tennis racket and grabbed all the hair on Rupert's head in her fist. Rupert had a lot of golden coloured hair. His mother thought it was beautiful to behold and took delight in allowing it to go extra long. The trench pole had as great a dislike for long hair and boys as she had for plates and pigtails on girls and she was about to show it. She took a firm grip on Rupert's long golden tresses with her giant hand and then, by raising her muscular right arm, she lifted the helpless boy clean out of his chair and held him aloft. Rupert yelled. He twisted and squirmed and kicked the air and went on yelling like a stuck pig. And Mitch Trunchbull bellowed, Two sevens are fourteen. Two sevens are fourteen. I'm not letting you go till you say it. From the back of the class, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, please let him down. You're hurting him. All his hair might come out. And well, it might if he doesn't stop wriggling, staunches the trench bull. Keep still, you squirming worm. It really was an extraordinary sight to see this giant headmistress dangling the small boy high in the air and the boy spinning and twisting like something on the end of a string and shrieking his head off. Say it, bellows the trench bull. Say two sevens or fourteen. Hurry up or I'll start jerking you up and down and then your hair really will come out and we'll have enough of it to stuff a sofa. Get on with it, boy. Say two sevens or fourteen and I'll let you go. Two sevens or fourteen gasped robert whereupon the trench bull true to her word opened her hand and quite literally let him go he was a long way off the ground when she released him and he plummeted to earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football get up and stop whimpering the trench bull barked rupert got up and went back to his desk massaging his scalp with both hands the trench bull returned to the front of the desk the children sat there hypnotized none of them had seen anything quite like this before it was a splendid entertainment it was better than a pantomime, but with one big difference. In this room, there was an enormous human bomb in front of them, which was liable to explode and blow someone to bits any moment. The children's eyes were riveted on the headmistress. I don't like small people, she was saying. Small people should never be seen by anybody. They should be kept, kept out of sight in boxes like hairpins and buttons. I cannot for the life of me see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. Another extremely brave little boy in the front row spoke up and said, But surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunchbull, weren't you? I was never a small person, she snapped. I have been large all my life and I don't see why others can't be the same way. But you must have started out as a baby, the boy said. Me, a baby, shouted the Trunchbull. How dare you suggest such a thing? What cheek, what infernal insolence. What's your name, boy, and stand up when you speak to me. The boy stood up. My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trunchbull, he said. Eric, what? The trench boy shouted. Ink, the boy said. Don't be an ass, boy. There's no such name. Look in the phone book, Eric said. You'll see my father there under ink. Well, very well, then, the trench boy said. You may be ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not indelible. I'll soon rub you off if you try getting clever with me. Spell what? I don't understand, Eric said. What do you want me to spell? Spell what, you idiot? Spell the word what? W O T, Eric said, answering too quickly. There was a nasty silence. I'll give you one more chance, the trench bull said, not moving. Oh, yes, I know, Eric said. It's got a H in it. W H O T. It's easy. In two large strides, the trench bull was behind Eric's desk, and there she stood, a pillar of doom, towering over the helpless boy. Eric glanced fearfully, fearfully back over his shoulder at the monster. I was right, wasn't I? He murmured nervously. You were wrong, the trench bull barked. In fact, you strike me as a sort of poisonous little pockmark. I will always be wrong. You sit wrong. You look wrong. You speak wrong. You are wrong all round. I will give you one more chance to be right. Spell what? Eric hesitated. Then he said very slowly, It's not W-O-T and it's not W-H-O-T. Ah, I know. It must be W-H-O-T.
T T. Standing behind Eric, the trench boy reached out and took hold of the boy's two ears, one with each hand, pinching them between forefinger and thumb. Ow, Eric said, ow, you're hurting me. I haven't started yet, the trench boy said briskly, and now taking a firm grip on his two ears, she lifted him bodily out of his seat and held him aloft. Like Rupert before him, Eric squealed the house squeal the house down from the back of the classroom miss honey cried out miss trunchbull don't please let him go his ears might come off they'll never come off the trunchbull shouted back i have discovered through long experience miss honey that the ears of small boys are stuck very firmly to their heads let him go miss trunchbull please begged miss honey you could damage him you really could you could wrench them right off. Ears never come off, the trench boy shouted. They stretch most marvellously, like these are doing now. But I can assure you, they never come off. Eric was squealing louder than ever and peddling the air with his legs. Matilda had never before seen a boy, or anyone else for that matter, held aloft by his ears alone. Like Miss Honey, she felt sure both ears were going to come off at any moment with all the weight that was on them. The trench boy was shouting. The word what is spelled W-H-A-T. Now spell it, you little wart. Eric didn't hesitate. He had learned from watching Rupert a few minutes before that the quicker you answer, the quicker you release. W-H-A-T, he squealed, spells what? Still holding him by the ears, the trench bull lowered him back into his chair behind his desk. Then she marched back to the front of his class, dusting off his hands one against the other like someone had been handling something rather grimy. That's the way to make them learn, Miss Honey, she said. You take it from me. It's no good just telling them. You've got to hammer it into them. There's nothing like a little twisting and twiddling to encourage them to remember things. It concentrates their minds wonderfully. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchbull, Miss Honey cried out. Oh, I have. I'm quite sure I have, the Trunchbull answered, grinning. Eric's ears will have stretched quite considerably in the last couple of minutes. They'll be much longer now than they ever were before. There's nothing wrong with that, Miss Honey. It'll give them an interesting pixie look for the rest of his life. But Miss Trunchbull, oh, do shut up, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. If you can't cope in here, then you can go and find a job in some Cottonwood private school for rich brass. When you have been teaching as long as I have, you'll realise that it's no good at all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey, by Mr Dickens. Read about Mr Watford Squeers, the admirable headmaster of Buffy's Hall. He knew how to handle the little brutes, didn't he? He knew how to use the birch, didn't he? He kept his backside so warm you could have fried eggs and bacon on them. A fine book, that. But I don't suppose this bunch of morons we've got here will ever read it, because by the time, by the, because by the look of them, they're never going to learn to read anything. I've read it, Matilda said quietly. The trench boy flicked her head round and looked carefully at the small girl with dark hair and deep brown eyes sitting in the second row. What did you say? She asked sharply. I said I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You are lying to me, madam, the trunchbull shouted, glaring at Matilda. I doubt there is a single child in the entire school who has read that book. And here you are, an unhatched shrimp, sitting in the lowest form there is, trying to tell me a whopping great lie like that. Why do you do it? You must take me for a fool. Do you take me for a fool, child? Well, Matilda said. Then she hesitated. She would like to have said, yes, I jolly well do, but that would have been suicide. Well, she said again, still hesitating, still refusing to say no. The trunchbull sensed what the child was thinking and she didn't like it. Stand up when you speak to me, she snapped. What is your name? Matilda stood up and said, My name is Matilda Wormwood, Miss Trunchbull. Wormwood, is it? The trunchbull said. In that case, you must be the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. He's a crook, the trunchbull shouted. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car that he said was almost new. I thought he was a splendid fellow then. But this morning, while I was driving that car through the village, the entire engine fell out onto the road. The whole thing was filled with sawdust. The man's a thief and a robber. I'll have his skin for sausages. You see if I don't. He's clever at his business, Matilda said. Clever my foot, he shouted. Uh, clever my foot, the trench bull shouted. Miss Honey tells me that you are meant to be clever too. Well, madam, I don't like clever people. They are all crooked. You are most certainly crooked. Before I fell out with your father, he told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved at home. But you'd better not try anything in this school, young lady. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet. Right, we'll end there because we've run out of time. So we'll catch up with this next week. I hope you enjoyed today's reading.